add on at the end uh, because he's currently in a taxi, but the dedication from both of us will be assured to make sure that the RDF are safe, the hostages come back safely and unscathed, all of Israel is protected, and we smash our enemies and they obliterate it. Amen. Right, so let me just tell you where we are. We're in 115 stuff. We dealt with this issue in a very brief on Saturday night because our Mishnah spoke of one who recognized his stolen articles in the possession of another who had bought them from an unidentified thief. In other words, we said uh, Ruvain recognized his articles with Shimon and Shimon said, I never stole them. I bought it from a guy in the marketplace except that week. And from then on, all the goods uh, in the flea market, that vendor was not found to be there. So he disappeared. He obviously maybe once a month comes, pays his daily fee at the flea market store and sells it, but it's stolen goods. So we're saying that what is the law, according to the Gomorrah, where the thief was discovered? So um, it was stated if one stole articles and sold them, and afterwards the thief was discovered, Rav said in the name of Rav Chia, the claim of the owner is only against the first one, who is the thief, the one directly responsible uh, for making sure that they were stolen. But according mm. to that opinion, according to Rav, who said in the name of Rav Chia, the owner has the right to collect monetary compensation from the thief, but he has no claim against the buyer. This means that even if the buyer has not legally acquired the stolen articles through Yosh, which is despair and a change of domain, for example, in which case he has got to certainly return them. You know, um, so it's not a question as far as that's concerned. The owner has to compensate the buyer for his loss. Even though the thief has been discovered, the buyer is not obligated to return the articles to the owner, according to that opinion, without compensation. And basically, um, what would happen is, uh, say, for example, uh, Gavin had his goods stolen and I went to the Rosebank flea market and uh, Gavin recognized his uh, family heirlooms, etc. And I said, I bought it from the sky. Gavin, according to um, Rav, who brings in the opinion of Rav Khia, Gavin would have to pay me for getting his items back. Um, now, uh, Gavin's uh, disappeared at the moment. Uh, I'm just warming up some food. Sorry, uh, just carry on. I can hear you 100%. All right, we're running for Kevin. I'll be in a second. I think it's warm, in which case I can uh, just eat while we carry on. Ask Kevin. Yeah, Kevin's coming back now. But he got out the taxi. This thing's not warm. I have to warm it again, sorry. Kev, can you hear us? Gavin, Damon. Kev? Yes, so now, now I'm, 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 I'm in, in the complex here. So I come on. I'm going to just try and find a place to sit. Okay. okay. It's a complex I issue, think, Kevin. Okay. Totally. So, as, 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 like many Gamoras. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Just waiting a second for Gavin. I'm just trying to warm up some food. I, I thought I did. It's, it's still cold. Okay. Uh, trying again. Okay, so we've got two opinions. The previous Mishnah, Kevin, was a case where the thief was not identified and Ruvain recognized his goods uh, with Shimon and he said, those are mine. And Shimon said, but I actually bought them from the Rosebank flea market. Let's try and find the vendor. And the vendor was nowhere to be found. He paid for the day's use of the stall and that was it. So in that case, if... Uh, if Ruvain wanted the goods back from the Shimon who bought it legitimately, there's what you call a remedy of the marketplace where he would have to buy it from Shimon. And you might say, well, why? Well, the truth of it is that Ruvain, um, number one, d um, uh, ba basic, basically Ruvain doesn't have to biblically. 
especially if there was no yush or chait of domain. But rabbinically, the reason why it's done is to protect those that purchase from the marketplace. And then what happens is when the thief's discovered, generally the claim will be against um, uh, the thief when he's found so that the original victim can sue him and say, I gave money, uh, well, I gave compensation to the buyer for the amount he paid. And he has to take a shavu of the buyer in terms of what he did pay. Now, Gavin brought up a good point is that it's kind of unfair a little bit for the original owner in that case. And in another case, it can be a bit fair for the buyer. So in the first case, when there's a biblical enactment, it's the buyer that loses out, Gavin, because at the end of the day, um, he has to be careful where he buys it from. There has to be a sense of legitimacy. So it's the buyer's fault uh, to having not acted with uh, a certain amount of caution. With the rabbinical enactment, it protects the buyer but then the victim falls prey to losing money unnecessarily. But if he wants his goods back, and they're that sentimental to him, he's going to have to deal with it. It's going to end up in tears for either party. So according to Rav, who said in the name of Rav Kia, when the identity of the thief is um, revealed, the claim of the owner is against the thief only. Okay? And what happens in that case is that the buyer... Um, uh, basically, um, uh, even like in a let me just put it like this so, even though the owner can collect monetary compensation from the thief, it's not the buyer's problem in this particular case, according to the according to love. Because even if the buyer hadn't really acquired the stolen articles through your ush, right, in which case he's got to return them. If there's, if there's no Yush, there's no question he has to return it. But the owner has to compensate the buyer for his loss. So even though the thief has been discovered, it's not the buyer's fault, and he's not obligated to return the articles that he purchased with uh, proper money. And if the owner wants it, he has to uh, pay compensation to the buyer. So then what is the story here? So the story is very simple. The victim has to sue the thief for return of the purchase money that he gave to the buy in return for his goods. And the buyer has to make a shavu, an oath, in terms of what he paid. That's according to Rashi. There's a second opinion, which is contrary to that, which says Rav Yochanan said in the name of Rav Yanan, the claim of the owner is against both the uh, thief uh, and the buyer, which means he can choose which one he wants to sue. He has the option of collecting money from either the thief or recovering his property from the buyer without paying him. That's the distinction here. So the premise of this opinion is that although the buyer didn't steal directly from the victim, he's legally classified as a thief. Why? Because he's depriving the owner of his possessions. So the owner has a direct monetary claim on the buyer, just as he does on the thief himself. So the owner can require the buyer to return the stolen goods and doesn't have to pay him anything. So in a certain way, Rav and Rav Yochanan both agree that the owner has the right to sue the thief himself. At that point, they don't dispute. They also agree that the buyer must return the stolen items, providing that uh, no um, acquisition has taken place through despair, you wish from the uh, original owner, nor a change of domain. Basically, the only point of contention is whether the owner, upon recovering his property, is required to compensate the buyer. So let's just keep it simple. That's the only issue at hand here. Now, the Gemara is going to even reconcile it further, because according to Rav Yosef, they don't even really disagree much on this issue either. Why? Because in Rav Yochanan's ruling, uh, the reference is to goods that were sold before the owner's despair, in which case the claim of the owner is also against the buyer to return the stolen goods without receiving compensation, because the only way that Gavin, the buyer, would acquire it is actually not through purchasing it. It's um, he can only acquire the stolen goods because A is a third party, uh, whereas the third part, whereas the thief himself acquires the stolen goods with the ush and a change of domain, but has to pay monetary compensation. But a third party, the buyer wouldn't have to prior to your ush, um, according to Rav Yosef, because uh, the um, the owner hasn't despaired of getting it back yet. And at the end of the day, 
you have to be very careful where you purchase goods from. If you buy a Porsche from Nigerians for 100 grand off the price, you can be pretty sure that it's stolen. Okay? You can be pretty sure. So, therefore, according to that, there's no compensation. But here in Rav's ruling, the first case, the references to goods that were sold after the owner's despair, in which case the buyer acquired them through despair and a change of domain. So therefore, the claim of the victim is only against the thief and not against the buyer. Okay? So what we're saying is the victim cannot demand that the buyer return the stolen property, even for compensation, because it now belongs to the buyer because of those uh, particular principles. Now, um, you you have a, this Rav Yosef's explanation of Rav Yochanan and Rav reconciling, and it's just a case of before you usher a change of domain or after. It seems to be that the only way he can reconcile the opinions of Rav and Rav Yochanan is to say they both agree with Rav Chista's ruling. So just to save time, in the 111th Duff in Bet, Rav Chista ruled that if a person stole something and another consumed it prior to the owner's yush, the owner can collect compensation from either party. And guys, the reason for Rav Chista's opinion is that one who takes hold of stolen goods prior to yush, well, they didn't actually steal them himself from the owner. He's got the legal status of the thief with his attendant liabilities. Why? Because he's deprived the owner of what is his. There's no yush despair to affect acquisition for that third party. So if he consumes the goods, he's liable to pay for them. So here too, although the buyer paid for the stolen goods and he didn't steal them directly, he's nevertheless deemed a thief with respect to withholding goods that actually belong to the owner. So he's got to return the property and cannot demand the owner reimburse him for his loss if it's prior to your ush. Now, if the thief hasn't been discovered yet, as in our Mishnah, the buyer would be rabbinically entitled to compensate the owner. Um, uh, sorry. The buyer would be entitled to be compensated by the owner. Sorry, guys, I've got a big tongue to ask. Why? The Takana Sashuk, which is the remedy of the marketplace, means that biblically, uh, this uh, this was be for you, uh, Ush, um, the, um, the 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 wouldn't uh, uh, there wouldn't be any way that uh, after just hang on a sec, guys. I just got something in my throat. Give me a second. It's pausing. Shit. Okay. So okay, the bar paid for the stolen goods and he didn't steal them, but because he's deprived the owner of them, he's seen as a halachic thief. So he's got to return the property and can't demand the owner reimburse him for his loss. Why? Very simple, Gavin. In this particular case, case the thief has been identified. And since the thief has identified, then what will happen is that person that purchased the goods can go back to the thief and want his money back. But then he cannot demand the money from the victim. The thief has been discovered. If the thief has not been discovered, the buyer would be rabbinically entitled to compensation from the owner because he's got no way of retrieving his money. That's the remedy of the marketplace. But in the present case, where the thief has been discovered, the owner doesn't even have a rabbinic obligation to pay the buyer because exactly that. It's the buyer's problem, and he has to retrieve the money from the thief. It was actually his fault. Gavin, it was his fault more than it was the victim's. You can say that much. Yeah, yeah that's the truth. Yeah. The victim, yeah, yeah. It, it's, it's not his fault here even at all. The buyer's got less culpability than the thief, no question, but he has certainly more than a victim. And, and that's how it can sit well with you, because I was thinking about your question on Saturday night. It was a good one. Yeah. Okay. So according to uh, uh, Arthur, according to Rav Yosef's explanation, if the owner has not yet reached this point of despair, Yush, Rav would actually agree with Rav Yochanan that the owner has a claim against the buyer, because there's no way that the buyer acquired it. He was only allowed to have some sort of claim on it because the original owner uh, got to this point of desperation and despair and gave up, and there was a change of domain. 
So that's according to Rav Yosef, but not everybody agrees with Rav Yosef because Abaya has got a different opinion. He said, look, you saying that they don't disagree and it's only a point of pre yush or post yush That's what you're saying. But in fact, it's a little bit more uh, complicated yet uh, than that. Why? Because we we learned something in a in a particular Mishnah, and if you go to Chulin 132a, we learn that this there's a rule. Okay, I'm just going to give you a bit of background. Is that the Torah in Devarim Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 3 commands a non kohen who slaughtered an ox or a sheep or a goat for non sacrificial purposes. He still has to give the right foreleg, jaws, and more to the cone. Now, I didn't know what a more was. So a more is certain parts of the um, esophagus and other parts apart from the jaw, the meaty part that is contained between the teeth, so to speak. So if a butcher slaughters an animal and then sells the kohanic gifts, he's in fact stolen them from the kohanic because it's not his to sell. So... This is almost the case of a pre yush situation. Why? Because the Kohen has not despaired of retrieving these gifts for himself, according to Rashi. He's got no reason to think he's not going to get it back, so there's no yush. So it's not, uh, it doesn't belong to the the, the, the the buyer who purchased the meat from the butcher. Okay? So it says, uh, according to a buyer, to Rav Yosef, that in this case, they do disagree. It's not only a case where uh, everything is cool before the Yush process and that the buyer doesn't uh, uh, acquire, uh, uh, the buyer doesn't acquire it and post Yush, the buyer does have a share uh, in keeping it and it has to be paid off. Say so no, in this particular case, if one said to a butcher, sell me the innards of a cow and the Kwame gifts were among them, uh, in other words, the butcher presented him with all the innards, including the maw, the jaw, the right foreleg, etc. It's assumed that it's going to be given to the cone by the purchaser. And um, the buyer has to then give the gift to a cone, and the butcher does not deduct the value of the coin the gifts from the purchase price. What does that mean? Is it can be assumed that the maw was not included in the sale. Since both the buyer and the seller knew that it had to be given to a Cohen. So this first case of the Mishnah doesn't involve any theft at all. Because the more never left the possession of the Cohen. Nobody's looking to steal it. So the responsibility for giving the more to the Cohen now happens to fall on the buyer where it uh, fell on the butcher before. Not because of any other reason as who currently possesses it. Who has it? Okay. However, if uh, the purchaser bought the cow's innards from the butcher by uh, from the butcher by weight, in other words, is he actually um, was was pretty specific. The buyer gives the kohanic gifts to a kohen, and he deducts their value from the purchase price. Why? Uh, because obviously the kohen has to get his portion. And why does he deduct the value of the purchase price from the butcher? It's pretty clear. If the buyer bought a certain weight of innards, the sale does include the more, which constitutes theft from the con. So the buyer must give the more to the con, no question. And the con doesn't have to pay him anything for it. Why? Because there was no Yerush. He's expecting to get it. But then um, the purchaser has to claim from the butcher the money he paid for the more because it wasn't the butcher's to sell. You know, he's not entitled to make a profit of it. Uh, that has to be that has to be deducted. And Ralph said an explanation of the last ruling, which implies that the buyer can collect compensation only from the butcher and not from the coin. Rav adds a statement. He said, "Listen, they taught that the buyer has no right to compensation from the coin only when he weighed the innards for himself. Meaning, it was a case where the, it was the buyer who initiated the theft of the mall and not the butcher." Because it was the purchaser that decided to use the scales and weigh it himself. And therefore, the mission is justified in allowing the Cohen to collect the coin it gets from the buyer without paying him anything for it. However, if the butcher weighed the innards for the purchaser, 
the claim of the Kohen is actually against the butcher. It's against the butcher. Why? Because um, he shouldn't have put it amongst uh, the purchaser's goods, nor should he have charged the purchaser for it. So in that case, he can sue only the butcher. And, and therefore, if he wants to collect the gifts, the Kohen, from the buyer, he's got to pay for them. Well, a very simple explanation, because it was the butcher who stole them all. So in accordance with the ruling above, uh, that a victim of theft has a claim only on the thief himself, Rav maintains that the Kohen can sue only the butcher, not the buyer. Uh, okay, so we see that even prior to Yush, Rav holds contrary to Rav Christa, because Rav Christa said, if it's a third party, whether it's a buyer or somebody that consumes it, there is liability that they have to return it to the Kohen. And we can see here that Rav doesn't agree. He says the owner has no claim on the buyer unless it was the buyer that was complicit in weighing the uh, part uh, liable for the Kohen and wanting to keep it for himself. So this obviously contradicts Rav Yosef, who asserts that basically Rav and Rav Yochanan agree with Rav Chester. Okay, very straightforward so far. Now, what would Rav Yosef uh, uh, reply to this uh, accusation by a buyer. He says, say that Rav means that the claim of Cohen is also against the butcher. What does that mean? means that the Cohen can sue either the buyer, uh, he may collect them all from the buyer without payment, or the butcher, um, uh, in other words, he may demand financial compensation for the loss of his mall. So according to Rav Yosef, he understood the mission as meaning that the Kohen can sue only the buyer. Okay? Uh, in, in order to get it back. Now, Rav therefore explains that the Mishnah has to refer to a buyer who weighed the meat himself. Because uh, in that case, the, the, it was the buyer who stole the Kohenic gifts. And he's the only one responsible for their turn. Now, if the butcher weighed the meat, uh, he's the thief. And in that case, the Kohen can sue either party. So you're saying, well, why can he sue either party? Because the, at the end of the day, the uh, buyer actually has the uh, portions belonging to the Kohen and is complicit in it. So it, it depends who, uh, uh, who was involved in the action itself. And Rav had to teach us because you might have said that Kohanic gifts can't be stolen and obviously the Kohen has no con complaints. He's got no claim against the butcher under any circumstances. Rav therefore informs us otherwise. So I'm going to explain to you what this means. Why would you say something obvious that whoever is involved in the theft is responsible? If both the, the butcher and the uh, buyer are responsible for the theft, you can sue either one. Uh, if he had to pay the uh, uh, the buyer for it, uh, and uh, uh, that's the butcher's responsibility, he uh, he has to he can sue the money he paid the buyer, the Cohen, in order to get his money back from the butcher. So he's ever complacent. So we say, well, why do you need to learn all of this? And it's pretty simple because we are saying that by Hashem's hand, Hashem divinely granted gifts to the Kohen, and therefore that divine instruction is so strong that you might have thought that gifts always considered to be in the possession of the Kohen. It doesn't matter who's holding them. It's a divine commandment, so it has to go back to the Kohen because Hashem said so. So it could be thought, even though that the butcher was complicit uh, uh, and he waited himself and gave the Kohanic gifts to the buyer, or well, the butcher uh, has decided uh, to weigh it and sell it off to the purchaser, that neither one of them has committed theft. Why? Because it never left the coin's position, uh, meaning that it had to go back to the coin either way. So then you'd say technically the coin had no claim against the butcher and he can only collect the gifts from the buyer because the buyer is the one that has it. So uh, Rav Yosef uh, does, doesn't agree with that at all. He's basically saying that um, when there's a transfer of a Kohanic gift from the original owner to another, it does constitute uh, theft. You can't say it's so strong just because it's been divinely 
uh, ordained like that because people have got free choice. So therefore, the Kohen can sue not only the buyer who has the Kohenic gifts in his possession, but the butcher as well. Because he wants his uh, gifts back, or the butcher was the one that sold it to him. So a buyer stated earlier, if you remember, guys, that Rav and Rav Yochanan disagree even when the sale was made prior to Yush. Rav rules that only a thief can be sued, and Rav Yochanan maintains that the buyer can be sued as well if he's complicit. A buyer doesn't explain the basis of the dispute exactly. Um, but the only thing that was mentioned uh, uh, earlier was that they uh, he's saying that we want to know how how, how to, does he get to that point. So the Gemara says, look, a buyer can understand the opinion of Rav and Rav Yochanan. And according to a buyer who says that they do disagree, we want to know what point they disagree on. We're saying they disagree with regards to Rav Chista's ruling. So again, Rav Chista holds that whether or not the thief consumed or buys the stolen property before Yush, um, or the third party that went to Shabbos at the home of the thief consumed the goods before Yush, the owner has the option of suing either party, either the third party or the original thief. And Rav Yochanan accepts Rav Chista's ruling. Rav disagrees. He said the owner has no claim against the buyer or the third party, which is what Gavin was saying the other day, because he didn't know where, what he was eating. And um, only a buyer would hold that Rav holds like that. But according to other opinions of Rav, with Rav Yosef, he agrees with Rav Chista that, okay, so you were thinking of getting a free Friday night meal, uh, and you didn't. You had to pay for it. But guess what? You enjoyed it. So if you had to buy the butcher's meat and you enjoyed the steak, so what, Gavin? It's not the victim's fault. You get what I'm saying? That's that's where they're coming from. So there's a third explanation that's given. We don't have too long left, guys. I'm going through this as quickly as possible. What's the difference between Rav and Rav Yochanan? According to Rav Zavid, he's saying the case is where the owner despaired after the stolen property was in the possession of the buyer. But when it was still in the possession of the thief, he didn't despair because he thought he'd get it back. It was only when it left the thief's hands that he thought that the so remote getting it back, despair took place. And it's this little point that they disagree. Rav Yochanan, the master, holds that if there was first despair and afterwards a change of domain, that's the correct order. And therefore, the buyer acquires the stolen property. Whereas if there was first a change of domain and only afterwards there was despair on the part of the victim, he doesn't acquire it because it has to follow certain ordered protocol. It has to be Yush and then a change of domain, not the other way around. So that's uh, according to um, uh, Rav Zavid's opinion on Rav Yochanan. But Rav holds that it doesn't make any difference which way it occurs. If there was a change of domain and afterwards despair or despair in a change of domain. Either way, the two steps and protocols activated the acquisition for the buyer for the stolen goods when there was your ocean change of domain. It doesn't matter what order it happened in. Now we've got uh, we've still got a little bit of time, guys. I'm going as quickly as I can. There's a fourth explanation of the difference between Rav and Rav Yochanan. According to Rav Papa, with respect to the stolen cloak itself, he's now saying a guy's uh, bomber jacket was stolen or his cloak was stolen. Both Rav and Rav Yochanan agree that it has to be returned to the owner. Okay, In other words, in Rav Papa's view, Rav and Rav Yochanan speak of a situation prior to your Ush, and they both accept Rav Christa's ruling that in such a situation, the owner has a claim against the buyer. Therefore, the buyer must return the stolen article, whether it's a jacket or a suit, without compensation, even if he has a rabbinic right to compensation from the owner under the remedy of the marketplace. That's a separate matter. He's got to surrender the article immediately, and he's forbidden to withhold it as security for his payment. The payment is a separate legal issue, but he has to hand over the, uh, the, the stolen item. Now, um, and and they disagree as to whether the rabbis in this case applied the remedy of the marketplace 
where the thief has been discovered. Because we know when the thief has not been discovered, the remedy of the marketplace kicks in. But the reason why we're saying here is why there might not be a remedy of the marketplace is the buyer can sue the person he purchased it from when the thief's identity is discovered. Okay? And therefore, um, after the buyer has returned the cloak, we want to know, did the rabbis grant him the right for compensation or is his only option to sue the thief? So Rav said in the name of Rav Chia, the claim of the buyer is only against the thief and not against the owner. In other words, the owner is a victim here. He has to look where he purchased it from. If he's got a claim, the buyer has to take it up with the store owner. So that's the law, according to Rav, with respect to the buyer, that he's got to only recover his money from the thief. Okay? And so, therefore, there's no remedy of the marketplace in this case. But Rav Yochanan said the claim of the buyer could be either against the original owner, because at the end of the day, he purchased it in good faith, and then the owner has to give him compensation for what he paid for the goods, under oath he will say, and the thief will corroborate it. And then the original victim can sue the thief for the money he handed over in order to get his goods back from the buyer. And that way, the thief ends up paying. But it ends up being more aggravating for the victim. So that is the law with respect to the buyer, that he can recover his money even from the owner. And the reason is the rabbis did apply the remedy of the marketplace in that case. So it depends who gets the aggravation, but nobody's going to be stuffed for money. Guys, we've only got a few minutes. So, and does Rav hold that they do not apply the remedy of the marketplace in this case, where the thief has been discovered? So he's saying that we're learning here that Rav doesn't apply the rule. So we're saying there seems to be a contradiction because there was another case where Rav Huna, who was the disciple of Rav, and Rav Huna would generally follow Rav, said that he ruled contrary. Because when Hanan the wicked stole a cloak and sold it, the owner came before Rav Huna for a halachic judgment. And Rav Huna said to the man, go redeem your pledge, meaning that he is to pay the buyer compensation for the cloak. So Rav's own disciple applied the remedy of the marketplace even after the thief had been discovered. So we're saying a student always follows his master. So does Rav really hold that there's no remedy of the marketplace when the, uh, the thief's identity is known? And the Gemara says no. The reason why his student, Rav Huna, applied the remedy of the marketplace is that the person who was the thief, Hanan the wicked, had no money. He was a gambler, like. So it wouldn't have helped to sue him. So at the end of the day, uh, if he wanted his goods back, the original owner, he'd have to pay the buyer. Otherwise, the buyer wasn't going to relinquish his goods because if you discover the identity of a thief and it's as if he's got no money, what have you discovered? You discovered you're not going to get your money back. That's what you've discovered. All right. Guys, um, uh, let's, let's end it at this night. How many minutes you have left, Damon? We got uh, we got uh, three three minutes. Can I give my? I've got an idea. Please. Uh, can I give it to Shulav? Okay. So I went with Avron to Rav Dov Panzer's shul for Mincha uh, Mariv, and uh, he gave across this idea. So during the rainy season, if you hear thunder, and if you see lightning, you have to say a separate bracha. So the bracha for for lightning is Baruchat Hashem. The, the, the brocha for thunder is brocha tashem ekenim echalam shekoha ugvurato male olam. And I'm just saying this so you guys can. I'm, I'm coming, I'm using this to illustrate a point. So basically, Rodolf Kenzer was saying that uh, if you have to say that as soon as possible, it's, it's, it's an opportunity which you might miss. And even if a rov is a Rosh Shiva like yourself, is giving a share, and he's about to give an idea across, he has to he has to say that either the brocha on thunder or lightning, and if by some chance he loses his train of thought, then so be it. It's not. It's uh, that has to uh, take precedence. You have to say this brocha, and even at a chuppah, he said Rav Dov, like I was at now. If you, if the, if the rabbi is about to say one of the Sheva brachot or any bracha, 
he has to actually say that bracha on the thunder or the lightning when he hears or sees it. So, uh, so can I just and, add, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, sorry, just one second. Um, um, Simcha Steinhauer does it actually, uh, in the middle of his year when it's thunder or lightning, yeah. he says the bracha immediately. Uh, he follows exactly so he what wanna, he He won't, Gavin, he won't rain on your parade. That's why he does it also. Yeah, well, and it's also warning us about the lightning and the thunder. Yeah. No, I'm joking. So but, that's no, but he does. So what I'm saying is that he does. He stops yeah. what he's doing and he does it immediately. Exactly. Absolutely. And if by some chance he loses his train of thought, he's not going to be. Uh, I mean, I shouldn't say this, like a guy on that level, guys harshly forgetting his train of thought because he said those one of either of those brachot. That he has to do. So even if he loses his train of thought, it's not not a big. It's not a. It's not a problem. Let's put it that way. But. Uh, we should be on such a level. It's, I mean, I'm not. Maybe one of you guys is. Oh, oh mate, no, all of us. Why not? We're going to try. <laughs> wow. No, we, we so, die. So you say we it try as soon as possible. Trying. Within it. like, I think it's within two or three seconds. You have to say it. What did he say? As soon as you hear or see the thunder or the lightning, you have to say it within, uh, within a second or two. Or five, maybe. I don't know exactly how yeah, I'm I need to learn it. You actually know it all the Well done. Well done, Kevin. I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, I didn't know yeah. either. And the very sheet one's actually quite easy. The the thunder one I think is a bit harder. The lightning one's a bit easier. Ose, Ose, Master, Mr. Brochatashem, and Kenamachan, Ose, he 